So starting with number five from our homework, which we did in class, I'm going to explain it once again. What we're going to focus in on first is recognizing that this is an exponential decay function because the base itself, the base itself is less than one, so that makes it a decay function. So whenever we graph exponential decay and growth functions, it's really easy to do. I always say ignore h and k, all right? Let's first identify h and k. h happens to be three and k happens to be negative five. So at the end of it all, we're gonna move all the coordinates three to the left and five down. So let's first find, or let's first make an xy table for the exponential decay function, the parent graph, y equals one third to the x. So there's my xy table, and notice that my inputs are in consecutive integer order. You have negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three. That makes it really easy for us to plug in zero right here, ignoring h and k, plugging in zero right here into this, the parent graph. And when you plug in zero, you get out of one. When you plug in one, you could plug it in right here and then see that it's one third, or you could simply take the base one third and use the one third to get the rest of your outputs. And you could only do that because these guys are in order. So if I take this output one and multiply it by one third, I'm gonna get one third. If I take the output one third and multiply it by one third, I'm gonna get one ninth. If I take the output one ninth and multiply it by one third, I'm gonna get one twenty seventh, which is hardly anything. As you can see, it's approaching zero. Now going backwards, if you're going, if you're going this way, multiply by one third, multiply by one third, multiply by one third, going backwards, it would be doing the reciprocal of multiplying by one third, which is multiplying by three over one, multiplying by the reciprocal of one third. So it's really like multiplying by three. So one over 27 times three gives us one ninth, times three gives us th one third, times three gives us one, times three gives us three, times three gives us nine, and times three gives us 27, which of course, we're not even gonna use this top one because it's already off the graph. So we have our coordinates. These are the coordinates to the parent graph, y equals one third to the x power. Let's graph them, and then we'll worry about translating them according to h and k. So if I graph them, let's start with zero, one. Uh, zero, one is uh, easy to do. You go to the origin, which is right here, and we go one up. So there is zero, one and we move on to the next uh, coordinate. Let's go with the easy one, negative one and three. Negative one and one, two, three, it's right here. And the next easiest one's negative two, nine. So negative two, that's two to the left from the origin, nine up, there's negative two, nine. And this guy right here, if we take a look at one and one third, that means we're gonna go from the origin, one, from the origin, here's the origin, one out and one third of the way up. It's not even halfway up. So you're gonna go out one and then one third of the way up, which is about right here. It's not even halfway up. Now, if you look at the next one, two and one ninth, that means you're gonna go out two and one ninth. It's hardly anything. It's like if you're still at zero. So you could put it like if it's at two zero, but you know that's two and one ninth. And the next one is three and one twenty seventh, which is even closer to zero. I can't really draw the difference with the with the pencil and paper between one ninth and one twenty seventh. It looks almost identical. It looks like they're both on the x-axis. So we know for a fact that all of these dots get closer and closer to zero, but we know it never actually touches, it just infinitely approaches. So you could actually draw the tail end of it like if it's actually touching the y equals zero line. Now the thing is this is our graph, but it's not our final graph because this is the parent graph. So if I want the final graph, I want to do the final graph in blue, I need to take all of my coordinates and move them three to the left, to the right, and five down. So if I take each of my coordinates and I go uh, three to the right, one, two, three, and five down, one, two, three, four, five, three and five, three and five, we'll get this new graph. So it kind of looks like they magically appeared, but I really did get my coordinate. I went one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, I took this next one, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. And I took this next one, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. And now I'm already getting really close to the tail end of my graph. Uh, so if I take a look at the asymptote here and I need to shift it five units down, I mean, if I move it three this way, who cares because it's going this way forever anyway. So I'll move it three this way, but who cares because it's going that way forever. But I'm going five down. So I'm gonna go one, two, three, four, five. My new asymptote's gonna be right here at the y equals 
negative 5 line, which is right here. Put the tail end of it right there. And let's just connect the dots that I have with the asymptote that I have. So I want to do that by getting a little closer. And I want to get the asymptote and just go, whoops, that shouldn't have, shouldn't have done that. Let me go like this, right on it, and then curve it up to hit those dots. Put an arrow on it. I know that's kind of ugly, but you get the picture. And we're done. We have the exponential decay function that is shifted three to the right and five down. That blue graph is it. Now, if we move on to number six, uh, we have the logarithm. Now, when we think of logarithm, it's easier to just block out the log, block out the log and uh, pretend that it's an exponential growth or decay function depending on what you see here. And as you can see, we have uh, y equals one-third to the x. So why am I doing this? Because it's really difficult to, to come up with coordinates for log base one-third of x, right? So I'm going to make an xy table. But instead of wasting all this time, we realize, wait a minute, we just did that. We have it right here, y equals one-third to the x. We just came up with all the x and y coordinates to this thing. So the reason why I want those coordinates instead of the logarithm function's coordinates is because it's really hard to come up with values. You can't just plug in a zero right here. It won't work. Right, when you're thinking about logarithms, one-third to what power gives you zero? It doesn't work. There is no value. It's, it doesn't work. So it's easier to think of, of covering up the log and pretending that it's an exponential growth or decay function, in this case a decay function. That way you could get the coordinates of that exponential decay function and then after that switch them so you could actually have the coordinates of your logarithmic function. Okay, so once again, cover up the log pretend it's an exponential growth or decay, come up with your coordinates, which are the same coordinates over here because we already came up with these coordinates, right? And then after you come up with those coordinates, all you have to do is uh, switch them. That way you could have the coordinates to your actual logarithm, okay? So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to scratch this out, and I'm going to get the actual coordinates to this guy, and I'm gonna write them right in here in this XY table. Now, how am I gonna do that? All I need to do is look at the previous values, which are right here, which was to the inverse of the logarithm. So this is the inverse coordinates. So if I want the actual coordinates of the logarithm, all we have to do is switch X and Y values. So instead of negative two and nine, we're gonna put 9 and negative 2. And for the sake of time, I just wrote them all right there. And as you could see, all I did was switch them. Instead of negative 2, 9, it's 9, negative 2 over here. Instead of negative 1, 3, it's 3, negative 1 over here. Instead of 0, 1, it's 1, 0, and so on and so on. So I switched them. So now I actually have the coordinates of the logarithmic function. So now I could graph them. And there is no h and k shift, so it's really just a question of plotting these points. So I'm zooming in a bit so you could see it better. Uh, 9, negative 2, you go out 9, negative 2. Uh, 3, negative 1, 3, negative 1. Uh, 1, 0, 1, 0 is right there. Now the tricky part, 1 third, so you're going to go from the origin, you're only going to go out 1 third of the way, and then up 1. But it's super close to 0. So actually let me zoom in even more so I could show you. 1 third of the way out and up 1 is going to be right there. It's not even halfway. And if you go one-ninth of the way out, it's even going to be closer to zero, but you're up one more unit because it's one-ninth and two. And the last one, one-twenty-seventh and three, that's super close to zero. I, I think we get the picture that it's going to infinitely approach the uh, x value of zero, which is the y-axis. If we zoom back a bit, um, that makes total sense because as you look at the x values, they really do approach zero. All right, so the x values approach zero, so you know that your asymptote is x equals zero. All right, if you're talking about asymptote. Uh, I don't think on the test I'm actually going to ask you to state the asymptote, but you should know how to do that. It's going to pop up on the midterm, so you might as well understand that right now. 
Anyways, let's finish uh, plotting or drawing the rest of this graph. All you got to do is follow the dots, connect it, and uh, put an arrow on it, and you're done. Let's move on to the third one, which is number seven. And as you could see, these three graphs build off of each other. Because you needed to come up with the coordinates first for the decay function. You use these coordinates to switch them to get the actual coordinates of the logarithmic function. And as you can see on number 7, we have the same exact logarithmic function as up here. The only difference is that you have an h and k shift. Over here you don't have an h and k shift. Down here you do have an h and k shift. So we're going to be using these same exact coordinates and shifting them 2 to the right and 3 up. So let me do that. So I just uh, copied those same coordinates that I had up here, right? That I had up here, and I just redid them, redid them down there. So now all we have to do is worry about shifting those coordinates uh, two units because the h is two, and you think opposite, so that means two to the right, and the k is three, so that means three up. So if I want, I could plot all of these points and then graph them. Or, if I want, I could actually think about the numbers right here on the x and add 2 to all of them. Because moving the x values 2 to the right means that you're adding 2 to all of them. So you could add 2 to the 9 and make it 11, 2 to the 3 and make it a 5. Um, and I might as well do that just to show you guys how you could do it numerically. You don't have to do it numerically. You could graph them. Um, let me do both ways. As you could see, I've plotted all the points uh, to the original parent graph, right? The logarithm uh, without the h and k. So all I did was uh, graph this guy right here. And I still need to shift it 2 to the right and 3 up. So I could take all these coordinates and move them 2 to the right, 3 up, 2 to the right, 3 up, 2 to the right, 3 up. Or I could have also done this numerically by, like I said, adding 2 to all my x's. And if you do add 2 to all your x's, those are the values you get. You get 11 instead of 9, 5 instead of 3. And then you go back to your y's and you think, what am I doing to my y's? Well, it's supposed to go up 3, so I need to add 3 to my y's. Oh, I'm sorry. This is an x, this is a y. So I want to add 3 to all my y's. That means I want to add 3 to the negative 2, and that's going to be positive 1, and so on and so on. And we end up with those y values right there. So now we know our actual coordinates, and I want to graph them in blue. If I do go out um, from the origin, if I go out to 11, which is 1 past the graph, it's outside, and then 1, I want to move it up 1. And then, of course, if I go to the next coordinate, 5, 2, from the origin, if I go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and up 2, I end up right here. And there's my blue coordinate, 5, 2. And then if I go to 3, 3 from the origin, it's 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. I apologize, that's the ugliest dot I've ever done. And um, of course, if I move uh, to the next point, which is 2 and a third and 4. So if I go from 0, 1, 2, and a little tiny bit more, then I go up to 4, I'm going to be right here. Okay. So we already could, once you get to the fractions, you could just jump to your asymptote. And your asymptote, as you could see, was at the x equals 0. But obviously, it needs to get shifted two units to the right. So if I go one, two units this way, here's my new asymptote. So I might as well draw that right there. There's my new asymptote. It looks like it's on the actual asymptote, which is x equals 2. The asymptote in this case is x equals 2 because it's running up and down at 2. And all we need to do is connect the dots and we're done. Connect it, connect it. Sorry, it's kind of ugly. But we have the blue graph being our final graph, not the red one. Uh, again, you could add 2 to the x's, add 3 to the y's to get your final coordinates. Or you could have just graphed this red one the way we did right here and taken each coordinate and moved it to this way, right? 1, 2, and then 3 up. Could have taken this one to this way and three up, and you could take this this one to this way three up, 
and you end up on that blue graph anyway. The asymptote, move it two this way and three up, it's still the same asymptote. So either way, 